As you guys mentioned, I, I spent 40 years in prison. Mm -hmm. More than 30 years of that was in solitary confinement. The, the institutions have constructed solitary confinement cells to deprive you of those uh, uh, sensory perceptions that an individual needs. It's either war, especially with that much time, do you dwell on the past and waste the moments that you have or do you just keep it pushing? So when you come out of uh, incarceration, you're coming out either one of two ways, uh, ready to live in the free world and all that it has to offer without animosity towards the things that you had experienced because it's a waste of time, or you're coming out with nothing but animosity. Somebody was saying somebody was an informant that grew up with me. And you can't say that about my friend and not have consequences. Welcome back to Retro Network Podcast. It's your boy Yak. It's your boy T. We got another special yeah. one for you today, man. Um, T was able to make it happen. He was able to make it happen. Yeah. He got a really great person on here that you worked with before. Like, what's your guys' relationship? I have, yeah, yeah. So, so I got hooked up with um, the gentleman that we have here through who was it? Was it my brother? I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and then we hit it off, right? I, at that point, when when me and and Jack. Morris, right? Jack Morris is in the house. Let's Jack get Morris, it, let's get it, man. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Thank you for being here, Jack. And uh, one of the things I was telling the fellas, right, that I was like, Jack is one of the individuals um, that's recognized throughout California mm -hmm. if you're in the know about anything having to do with prison reform, mm. right? And I, and the reason I told him, I was like, Jack is one of the individuals that's, that's the reason for all the spotlight, a lot of the spotlight, one of the individuals, one of many, right, um, for being in solitary confinement for an extensive amount of time. Mm. Um, and in this case, I believe it was 35 years. About 35 years. Yes. It's about 35 uh, years wow. in the shoe, in the hole, whatever you want to call it, right? <laughs> yeah. That's insane. So Humans Right Watch decided it was deemed uh, inhumane, right? So a human's right rights violation. So I figured, you know what? Jack's been out. He's cool. Why not uh, bring him on the pod? It's uh -huh. a pleasure to be here with you guys. Man, thank, thank you, man. man. Thank you. Um, but yeah, you were telling me about the game of where, uh, where I stay. So I'm like, what? I didn't even know it was the first. It's, mind you, okay, I'm coming from, this is the first time I really say it, but I'm coming from from Downey. So in Downey, Downey in the house. Downey in the house, hey, man. man. That's why I'm square, y'all. Like, I don't know <laughs> the real deal. Like, there's nothing that goes down there. But you were telling me it was one of the first places that that gangs were involved. They, like, yeah, Downey had a, a gang out there called the Downey Boys. It was in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. Mm. Uh, and they were one of the f one of the first mm -hmm. uh, recognized neighborhoods in all of Los Angeles County. Yeah. How do you learn this stuff, though? That's what I'm curious about, because there's so many people that are really... Like, you, you've been question. involved, but how do you get to learn all this stuff? Is it through experience, conversation? What's that like? Um, well, uh, uh, as you guys mentioned, I, I spent 40 years in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, mo more than 30 years of that was in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. And when you're staring at nothing but your shadow 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. you, you figure out ways to, to occupy time. I read a lot. Uh, I had a friend that owned a bookstore on the streets, and she would send us in 30 books a month. And, and I shared all the books with all everybody that was around me, and, and we read, you know, voraciously. And I read books from the Wu Li Masters, which is a physics book, to the migration patterns of a peregrine falcon. What I mean, you hell? just read to That's read, you know, <laughs> because yeah. uh, reading is an escape from the realities of what you're living. Uh, when you read, you're able to uh, imagine... Uh, what is actually taking place when the author is describing in a book that something is happening. Uh, the, the wind is blowing through the trees and the leaves are blowing down. Well, you could visualize that image just by the words and then you can uh, fluff it up. You know, what color are the leaves? How hard was the wind blowing? You know, did you hear the wind? All those things go through your imagination when you're reading and when you're stuck in a solitary confinement cell for decades, uh, you want to try to keep sane if you can. And that's part of the ways you do it. You read. That's interesting because, I mean, you don't think about that. Me, when I read a book, I'm like, ah, oh, this is a good story. But I don't think about those details because I don't, you know, when you're when you're incarcerated, you 
you listen, you hear it or you read that and you're able to build this image. I, I'm seeing it every day. So it's not a big deal. I'm experiencing it every day. It's not a big deal. But yeah. the fact that you are taking consideration every single word that is going through these books, it interests me. You have to, and you have to, I mean, it's like you just said, when you're reading, you're just reading the book, and if you find it uh, interesting, you say, oh, this is a good book. Right. But when you're stuck in a cell that has no windows, mm. and, and the only images you see moving on the wall are your own shadows, mm -hmm. well, then you you develop ways uh, of experiencing uh, some type of input sensory, uh, because the, the institutions have constructed solitary confinement cells to deprive you of those uh, uh, sensory perceptions that an individual needs, mm -hmm. needs, needs. Mm -hmm. uh, to survive, to live. Because a human being has to have contact with other human beings, whether it's verbal, whether it's physical, uh, whether it's mental, uh, emotional, whatever it is, a human being has to have it. So in a solitary confinement cell, you don't get that. So you read and you develop your own. Unfortunately, this does have an impact on the individual when they get out, because now they're not able to experience the realities of sensor perceptions. Yeah. Wow, so... I get I, it, so that's fucking deep. Ideally then, yeah. you, okay, you spent accumulated 40 years yes. overall incarcerated. Talk to us about kind of like what led you down that path, those total 40 years. Or well, it, kind of just like growing up. Yeah. It was and more than forty years. That? that forty years was just in the adult system. Wow. I also spent okay. a few years. In I didn't the, know that you had in, juvenile time too. In YAs, county oh camps, God. juvenile facilities. So from about the age of twelve or thirteen, uh, I never really spent time in the free world. Maybe ninety days at a, at a time, and then I'd go right back in. Um, so could you say right now you spent more time in Carson than you've been out? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. That is That's the, nuts. Yeah. So this isn't even like necessarily home to you yet? No, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, I mean, home now is where the heart, where the hat lays, right? You know what mm, I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, freedom um, is, is, is something that is experienced differently uh, when you're confined and considered uh socially dead you know what i mean so when you come out of uh, incarceration you're coming out either one of two ways uh ready to live in the free world and all that it has to offer without animosity towards the things that you had experienced because it's a waste of time or you're coming out with nothing but animosity as a result of having spent time which will affect your ability to live in the free world i mean that's those are the realities yeah. of incarceration I love how you articulated that, man, because that's, that's, that's what it is. It's either or, especially with that much time. Do you dwell on the past and waste the moments that you have, or do you just keep it pushing? And, yeah. that's, and that's the thing. I mean, um, I'm often asked, well, don't you have a lot of hatred in your heart? No, I don't. I had a lot of hatred in my heart. I, I sat in that cell with so much hatred in my heart that I battled daily. Daily, I battled with hatred and, and seeking revenge, and, and, and I won the battle. And then I realized in the battle, I had killed myself, you know? And wow. so when I was given an opportunity at life again, I stepped out into the free world without animosity to what I had experienced, but instead uh, being glad that I was able to survive what I had experienced and I was going to live uh, from that point forward uh, with the experiences uh, in order to uh, help me accomplish what I wanted to in my future. Mm. And put it. Um, quick, quick thing. You know what? I'm interested. If you can take us back to to what would lead. And you know what? When you said that you did juvenile hall time, YA time, what I'm tripping out on is what would lead a youth back in the 60s, early 70s, to to end up in YA. Not only that, I didn't even know they had YA back in the 60s, 70s. Oh, yeah. You know, what would lead a youth back in those times when you're listening to what, ODs and... Well, it's the same thing that will lead a youth to those, uh, in those paths today. Um, there are many, many things. I mean, we, we can all look at them and say, these are 
these are reasons. Uh, for me, it was, I, I had a great life. Um, I had a great family life. My father was in the military uh, 25 years. Wow. We had a home, all that stuff, you know. Uh, I had sisters. My mother loved me. She, my grandfather and my mother lived with us. We had a five-bedroom home of swimming pool in the backyard, you know, all that stuff. I, you know, went to school every day, and they bought me new clothes on, on Halloween and then on, on uh, Easter days and all that stuff. You know, I did my first Holy Communion. I did a confirmation. All those things that uh, you would think that uh, a person growing up in a, on, a, in a, on a pathway uh, to success mm -hmm. would have to follow. Um, what led me to incarceration, I, 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 I for me, and I'm going to only speak for me because I don't know if this will be the case for somebody else. Mm -hmm. For me, it was the belief uh, that I had the inability uh, to learn. Right? Um, when I was in school, early school, I mean fourth grade, third grade, I started to recognize myself. And uh, in classrooms, uh, they would be teaching, and I would not be able to comprehend what was being taught. Uh, mathematics, uh, reading, spelling, you know, history. And when that started to happen, uh, I felt myself uh, falling behind. Mm. And at that point, it was like, how can I catch up when I still don't understand what I'm supposed to be learning here? Uh, and then I found a way to be... Uh, identified, mm. uh, and that was through mischief. At that oh, time, it was shit. just mischief. You know what I mean? So, uh, so like, taking someone's home, homework and crumpling up or something? Yes. Stealing yeah. lunch money type deal? Like, stuff like not that? Not even that. That was a big thing. I didn't even do that. You know what oh, I mean? Okay, but no, it was, wow. this is the okay. beginning. But what happens is, uh, through those small things, and an example is um, when you steal. The first thing you steal is... Uh, you know, a penny candy, and then a candy bar, and then you steal a bike, and then you steal a car, and then you pick up a gun and you yeah. start robbing. Wow. And it's progressive. It's just like they say you use drugs. You know, drugs, mm. you move on to higher drugs. I believe that, and I'm not telling everybody not, not to use drugs, you know, because I've done, I can't tell anybody not to do anything because I've done it all. Uh, but I'm just saying, these are the things I believed after sitting in a cell and 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 conversing with myself and contemplating and exercising and, and utilizing transcendental meditation in order to discover who I was, I found out that my self-esteem at an early age was negatively impacted. And as a result of that, it hindered my ability to move forward at an early age. And education in a public school setting uh, brought on ridicule. I mean, oh, you're dumb. You don't know nothing. And then I found that uh, alternatives to addressing those remarks were available, and that was through violence. Hmm. So nobody would tell me, hey, you're dumb. You don't know nothing if I socked walked up to him and socked him in the nose or something <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, there's always somebody else around when you sock somebody in the nose that thinks, hey, I could sock him in the nose. Yeah, Ooh. and it's at that point you'll never catch up uh, because you're always trying to be something that you're not, especially when you don't know who you are. Uh, and that's for an adolescent, for a young kid, at any age, then or now, they're seeking to determine who they are, to figure out who they are. And us as adults don't even know who we are most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Imagine that understanding as a child and not being able to address that. So I, I think the support uh, that is required for a child at that age uh, can influence their path. That's what I want to touch on because I feel like that child development component is really big. But what I want to ask you is because you mentioned growing up in this great environment, right? Did you... Do you ever bring those feelings of like detachment from the education? Like you felt like, you know, you weren't 
meeting the, the criteria. You weren't like doing great at school. You weren't doing that. Do you ever bring those feelings or thoughts back home and inform anybody about it? Like mental health wise? Oh man. Talk Good to question. somebody about it? Or did you suppress that even then? Oh yeah, you suppressed it. I you know, you suppress it. Well, I don't know if I wanna use the word suppress. When you're living it, you suppress it. Mm. Uh, when you're no longer living it, for me, it no longer matters. Because now uh, I understand it. And to allow it to affect my progress now in life mm -hmm. would only be a hindrance that I'm hanging on my own self. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, I understand it. That's all that needs to be said. Will I allow it to now affect me? No, I won't. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, a prime example is when they let me out of prison. I didn't know electronics. You see, I had to ask somebody how, how, to, how to turn off this iPhone. I just got an iPhone. I had an Android for five years, learned it, and now I, the let dame says so I have to do it. You're, no, 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 no. You're way ahead of the game than this guy right here. Like, I was just going to say, you don't have to go the iPhone route. Don't feel like you have to go the iPhone well, route. Well, I was, I was convinced that I had to go Absolutely, <laughs> after having does. my Android for five years. Right. But I, I, when I, my first ex, uh, exposure to technology was in 2015 when mm. in solitary confinement they allowed me to have a Walkman. You know, the kind that you oh put the CD, CD in? They wouldn't let me have the CD, but they let me have the Walkman. What's the Walkman? Uh, like, like, the, like it opens up and you slap the disc yes. and you play it on the headphones yes. type deal? Oh, like an OG iPod. Yeah. But what's the and point of having radio. that if you have no CD? Well, I mean, I didn't question it. I was happy to have the, that's the Walkman. What, that's that, was a, that was a toy, huh? <laughs> yeah. that's that was my first experience to technology. I had mm -hmm. to learn which buttons to press just to make the thing work. You know this what I mean? This is 2015. This is 2015. When I had gotten out of prison, I had never... Uh, Worked with a desktop computer. I had never had a laptop computer. I had never had a phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know a lot of people in prison have phones, uh, but I never messed with them. Damn. So I want to touch on that. Definitely on that experience, like even coming out, what that whole new world yeah. was like. But now let's start talking to talking about when you started getting into like the juvenile halls and and so when did that start looking like? Was like yeah, we'll start with that. Well, I, a lot of people use the term gang. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not really into it. Uh, I recognize it as now as uh, something that's culturally acceptable. You know what I mean? But for me, gang uh, has a negative connotation. Mm. And this is why the people I grew up with mm -hmm. were my community members. We grew up. We were little kids. We grew up and we skinned our knees and we rode our bikes and we threw dirt clods at each other. And when we became older, we became protective of each other. And then we were labeled as a gang. But those were my, that was my community. Mm -hmm. I used to go to their homes and eat in their homes. I used to go to their homes and we sleep in their houses. You know what I mean? When they went on vacation, sometimes I went with them. That was my community. It was somebody else that identified us as a gang because we became protective of each other's existence. Interesting. You know? uh, yeah, I, I think that's super deep, man, that that you were around in, a, in an era where a lot of these groups didn't have names. These idea of gangs were, weren't a thing. They were barely starting to come up. 69, 68 is when a lot of them, right? People right. knew the older Hispanic gangs back in the 30s, 40s. But um, you were around in that era where you literally from one day to the next got categorized as a gang when you as were a just a group member. of boys. When people were still riding their bikes in the middle of the street or doing what else. Got, you know, so. And you have to think about why would somebody classify you as a gang? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it didn't serve the community, it didn't serve those that were being classified that way. So who determined that uh, classifying me as a child would benefit the community? It's, it's just, <laughs> for me, it was just another form of identifying for, for control. Uh, but like many things, it becomes culturally acceptable. You know what I mean? And now people, young people are proud to say, I'm from a gang. You know, I'm from, so I have nothing against gangs. I, I don't think uh, uh, there's anything wrong with being from a gang. What I think is wrong is if uh, you inflict something on somebody else um, for whatever reason in the name of a gang. You know what I mean? Uh, that's the thing. I, I mean, uh, I don't think gangs are criminals. I think breaking the law is criminal. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it's just, I, I watch the TV now and I see people cruising, you know, just the cruisers. And you see them holding signs saying cruising ain't, ain't uh, crying. It's true. You know what I mean? Someone developed a law to prevent them from cruising up and down the street because somebody else decided, hey, it takes me too long to get down the street. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the evolution of, of, of society takes those turns every now and then. And we live through them as a result of the classifications and limitations placed on that. I have nothing wrong with that. A society does need that. A society needs laws to govern its existence because without it, all of us would be carrying guns and anarchy would be the norm. Take what you want, keep what you can. So I, I, I understand laws are necessary. I understand uh, rules are required. I didn't understand that back then when I decided I'm going to live my life and do whatever I want, whenever I want, with it, wherever I want to do it. Gotcha. And, and this is back what year? What years did you say were like the pivotal moments where you knew jail and incarceration were kind of in your path? Well, I, I started going uh, probably before I was even a teenager, maybe 12, 13 years old. To, to the halls? Yes. But I remember when I went into the halls, uh, I went into the halls and the people that were in the halls were the same people I knew in the streets. Mm -hmm. That was my community. You know what yeah. I mean? The same things I did on the streets, those people were the same people who were in the halls. Of course, there were different elevations of them. There was those that were older. That, but when I went in there, there was kids my age that I had known on the streets. So incarceration wasn't foreign to me. It was an experience and a traumatic experience on its onset uh, but I acclimated, and, and that was a bad thing. That's a terrible thing when you go into an, 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 a, a carceral system and you're able to acclimate to that system. And, and I also say this, it's a necessity to have to be able to acclimate. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That environment, and, huh? And you hear yeah. that now when, it, when talk about that, did you, when you first went, got incarcerated into like the juvenile halls, did you have to acclimate even more from what you were coming from from the outside? Uh, what, or how old were you when you went in 13, I'm assuming? Because you said you started 12 getting, or 13. 12 yeah. or 13. Okay. Yeah. So what got you in there in the first, what was the first thing? Um, we were walking, uh, I was walking home from a party. It was, it was early in the morning. Mm -hmm. Damn. Right. And, uh. Yeah. And 12, 13. Wow. I'm like, yeah, 12, 13, you're young. You're yeah. it was, and it was a whole night party. You know what I mean? But and back then in the communities, like I said, it's, it's, everything around me was strawberry patches and cow, cow fields. You know what I mean? So where is this at? Norwalk. Norwalk was like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... What? Uh, I, I heard the... Shout out to uh, Lucky with the Hard Luck Show. Yeah. I believe um, I watched that podcast. And when you said that, I tripped the hell out. I'm like, you were around in a time when Norwalk was... was you said dirt roads and strawberry. Yeah. That, and that, that's I'm what like, we played. We played in the cow manures, chasing cows and riding cows and climbing up in the haystacks and, and you know, stealing uh, strawberries to eat. And, we were you know, that was what kids did. And that's so hard to, to believe because those right. for those that are listening in from like different states that don't know even know Norwalk, Norwalk now is like yeah. homes, like it's overpopulated. If anything, like it is popping there, you don't see not one piece of dirt. Patch of like land. a patch yeah. of land, a patch of dirt is just mm -hmm. fast food places everywhere. Like it's popping. Yeah. So just to even hear it like that, like it's just a big, a big like eye, eye opener. opener. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jinx on that. Part. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, but you know what? That's the evolution. Time don't stop. You know what I mean? And, and what we found to be uh, fantastic in our days is no longer eligible for that same classification later years. It's like the, a TV show I seen the other day where they were holding up uh, telephones. It's like you. What's a CD player? You know what right. I mean? That and and they're holding, what is this? And the kids, I don't know. What, what is that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's a telephone. Our, our ones on the corner, we used to drop a dime in it and, 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 and turn it, and you could call people. Let me ask mm -hmm. you something about that right now. If we got, it, Okay, use your hands. If, use your hands and show us you're talking on the phone. Okay, you do that. You do that. <laughs> Nowadays, these kids, I kid you not, bro. These kids will go. Because that's what you're doing with the iPhone. Ah, you're doing I know that this. One. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. You're yeah, yeah, a youngster, yeah. and they're literally like this. But you, you're OG. If not, you're 
Well, that because <laughs> that was the earphone and this was that the speaker. Part, exactly. But, but it that's, just shows. That's, yeah. Yeah. So just, I mean, I just bring that up. I don't, you know, I know it's random, but. Yeah, no, no, okay, no. Even but the mannerisms yeah. change with time. <laughs> yeah. That part, exactly. Change, yeah. So you're in Norwalk. You're, you know, you mess around. You guys are walking home, coming from a party. Uh, and I, uh, I broke a car window. Just mischievous. Just yeah. Nothing crazy. Mischievous. Um, and the, and were it was me. Like, were you smoking, drinking at this time already? Oh, yeah. Like at that age? Yeah, I was already smoking and drinking. Yeah. Damn, okay. And you're smoking like weed or like... Yeah. Just, you used to buy a bag of weed that big for $10. And you always carried a bag of weed in your pocket. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, yeah, smoking, drinking, and you know, doing everything mm -hmm. that the kids do today. Yeah. I broke a car window. A cop had to happened to be coming by Damn. and he started chasing us. And it was me and my friend and we ran through this park and the cop came after us and we split up. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the norm is to split up. Mm -hmm. Well, we split up and they caught me. You know what I mean? They oh, went after me. <laughs> yeah, You're, you got the, the that, short That fence the or this fence, I went that fence, and that's the fence they went to. <laughs> At 13 years old, you got caught up, you got tackled. How are you feeling, though? Like, are you thinking about your like your parents? You have a military parent. No, I was very right. I was very scared, first of all, because it was, I mean, you have a police officer chasing you. That part, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and uh, you don't have those... Um, uh, a feelings towards police officers at that, at that age. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You don't have... It's not until you become a criminal that you no longer like, like the police. Mm. Uh, because police oppose what you like and you oppose what they like, mm. you know? Right. Uh, so at that age, I wasn't opposed to police officers. Uh, so when they were chasing me, it was just fear. Uh, and when they caught me and uh, took me to jail... Then that's it was it was even scarier in that this is the first time I'm experiencing incarceration, you know, and and I'm put through the process of of being stripped out and being searched and being fingerprinted and and having to identify myself through uh, names and numbers and stuff like that, and I'm put in a cell in the whole nine yards and I'm transferred to the youth uh, to the juvenile facility at Los Padrinos in Linwood. I think it Downey or Linwood. Los somewhere. Sam, yeah, no, Los Padrinos. I think it was Downey, but I don't think it's there no more. Yeah, well, but, it was there. It was brand new, big old white wall. Mm. Uh, and going through that process, I remember uh, being stripped out, and they told me step into the shower where they delouse you. And uh, that I, that white powder or something. It, it was this time. It was pink. They used mm. to put pink uh, cream in your hand, and you have to spread it all over your body in case you have lice. And uh, I remember oh. stepping into the floor, and I could feel like mildew and oh, funk man, all on the nasty. floor. You know what yeah. I mean? Now you remember, I'm now sixty something years old, and I remember that experience. Right. That tells me now that I understand that 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 experience was traumatic to me. You know what I mean? Because here I am remembering. As, as vivid as it was taking place that moment today at the age I am. Mm -hmm. But I never addressed that, and I never knew that. I just experienced it and pushed through. Right. You know what I mean? So when you talk about tucking those feelings in, you tuck them in, especially when you go into the uh, units mm -hmm. and you see all kinds of people in there, and you know, wow. Mm. Here I am. With, and all those stories go through your head mm. that, that you've ever heard about jail. You know right. what I mean? All those things have a traumatic effect on you. It's the failure to acknowledge them or to be able to talk to somebody that it continues to have that effect on you years later. I'm glad you're highlighting that because it's like Brothers. talking to somebody is it's I feel like it's probably one of the closest thing to resolving your yourself like opening up well it, it's, it's, it's one of like one of the most beneficial it, it, it's things. beneficial in that it allows you to consider it you know what I mean I think um, talking to somebody it doesn't necessarily relieve you of it mm -hmm. you know what I mean but it allows you to address it well what was it like why did you feel that way and it when you say it out loud it diminishes its impact on you, you know what I mean it doesn't eliminate it. But fear is diminished when you're able to face it. 
Gotcha. Wow. That's... My boy Jack's a, 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 a <laughs> wizard with words. I'm telling you, man. For real. <laughs> it, so you, the way you, yeah, and that's one thing. I'm glad you pointed that out because I was even going to ask after. I'm like, you're explaining in such a way where it sounds like you were disgusted. You were not comfortable. But then you pointed it out. I didn't realize I wasn't comfortable until I got older. Yeah. Now, you, you got in, you're in, in there for how long? At that particular that time. time, I was only in there a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Yeah. What, what did Pop say? Right. That part. Did you bring out the belt? Uh... No, no, Ooh, really, no. My pops didn't. As a matter of fact, I don't think my mother and father ever hit me. None of mm. that discipline, like that. No. Gotcha. Okay. No. Because we—that's one thing I, I bring up too. When I even like even nowadays with, with like parents, you know, these parents will see these kids and they they look at them nowadays. They're thinking like, "Me and I was niños." Like, look at those kids. I mean, I, like that's why you gotta spank them a little bit every now and then and stuff like that. Or you like you will hear those like adults saying that. And so it's just it's just interests me that the idea like does doing these little like pats, you know, do they help? Are they beneficial? Like studies on that, yeah. like you know, is there what? How to discipline is what's the right way to discipline? Yeah, I and don't know. Like, I mean, it's a million dollar question. Right. What would you do if someone hit you today? Well, I mean, you hit them right back. Let's, let, but the thing is, I have this thing where it's like my first, my first, uh, my first answer isn't to hit back. I always try to resolve through words. I mean, call me what you want. Call me a little girl. Call me whatever. Call me the B word. But I'm more of a guy that will just try to resolve stuff through words. I, first. I think that's probably the most intelligent uh, and logical way to address an issue. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, I've done violence all my life. Mm -hmm. I, I committed violence from a little kid to a grown man. And I loved it mm -hmm. uh, because I loved being a criminal. Um. But when I started to realize the impact I was having on people uh, and, and the reason I was doing it, mm -hmm. then I started to look at it differently. The reason I was doing violence is for that same reason, to keep people fearful uh, that I learned as a kid in grade school. You know what I mean? I did it in the joint. I'd pick up a knife and hurt you quickly because everybody else would see that and they'd say, oh, you know what I mean? But there's always somebody else that won't feel that way. And I think words, uh, logic, uh, communication, uh, in order to express uh, a feeling, uh, to invoke uh, thought, to pass on knowledge, and logic uh, works much better. The problem is people at a young age uh, are not exposed to how to control uh, their reactions. They're exposed simply to react. Right. And, and I and to add to that, I think the one thing they are exposed to is is they have very clear pictures of the way they think they're supposed to react through fucking movies, social media, through Scarface, through Goodfellas, through you know. But even more than that, I mean, a lot of we could say that. I mean, you know, it it does. It's you know you. I used to hurt people all the time and tell them, this ain't the movies. Oh, you know man. what I mean? But I, I think the, the communication is something that has to take place in the home. But what does the home look like these days? Ooh. You know what I mean? Uh, and like I said, my family were military. So uh, the men in my family were me predominantly absent. Always overseas uh, or on some aircraft carrier or some. Makes, okay. So, so at that time where you were going in and out the halls and all that stuff, your your dad was uh, deployed or something, or he was he away? was often deployed. Yeah. Oh man, so that they don't. That's kind of crazy. I never thought that even though you would think, oh shit, you grew up in the army, army dad, whatever, your life should be perfect. It can easily go the opposite route when you you right. have an absentee parent. Yeah. You know? and, but the thing is, I I don't know if that's I don't know if that's I don't believe that was the reason. For I you, had a good life. You. I. Of course, we weren't rich, but I was never in need. I can't remember, and I've tried often to sit mm. down and think back to my very first thought. I don't know if you've ever tried that. I mean, just to sit and say, what can I remember from the very first thought in my mind that I can recall today? You know what I mean? And none of those uh, revolved around having a dysfunctional family. Mm. I never had that. You know what I mean? that I knew of. Uh, mine was uh, a lack of self-esteem. And I think that is what impacted me 
profoundly that ultimately led to the path that I took early on in life. Mm. And I think self-esteem is just is something that has to be um, taught to children. Absolutely. You know what I mean? One thing I, I feel like, at least, and I don't know if it's true yet, I'm still trying to learn and understand, and that's what we get through these interviews, like trying to find what the common common thing is. Where is it the most common need where we need to, to implement something like that? We're trying to find that that yeah. situation. And I think these a lot of these youth and kids need that approval or need someone that either even looks like them or is close to them, approve them and be like, good job, you're doing great, you're doing that. And with that, they know they don't have to try something else. They don't have to try nothing new. And so when they go into these communities, like you mentioned, not gangs, communities, they get that approval. Yeah. You're great. You did a great job. You did this. That builds their self-esteem. And I was like, all right, I'm doing something right. I don't have to change myself too much. I don't have to do that. Right. Um, Oprah okay. Winfrey once stated, I, I, I don't know how I got the statement, but I've used it before. And uh, she was talking to somebody and she says, um, uh, if you're looking to be like somebody else, then you'll never know who you are. Mm. because you can never be like somebody else. I mean, never. you can only be what that person was. You know what I mean? Because you see the action of that person and it's past for that person. Yeah. And you're stepping in and you're reacting mm -hmm. what this person was and it's a past. It's this past act. You'll never know who you are if you keep trying to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, so you, you've gone in, now you've gone into the juvenile hall you were released from then. With that experience, you didn't acknowledge your experiences at all. You were, you just went with the flow. And you kept it and you kept it suppressed. I mean not suppressed, but you kept it in. Now you went back out. How long were you out again until you got back into a camp? Um, I think I was probably out <clears throat> well, I was in and out at that okay. point. Okay. In and out, in and out. Probably every other weekend I was going back in. Wow. And, and, but it, at that time it was all for like just shit like that. Breaking windows, yeah, sitting small in a stuff. candy bar. Uh uh, a lot of them were for uh, minor in possession of alcohol, mm, you know, okay. minor in possession of uh, substance, uh, like weed. You're a lot. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you, shit. You, that's what we did. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, but you couldn't do it back then. Mm -hmm. And I was a juvenile, so they see me sitting on the corner in my neighborhood drinking beer, and they come up, you go to jail. They catch you walking down the street, and you have a, a lid of weed in your pocket. That's what they used to be called a lid. Uh, you'd go to jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I so, heard that. So term. I was saying, um, lid. <laughs> so the accumulation of that eventually led you to YA. Was that still the way it worked? A bunch of juvenile offenses will lead you to YA. Yeah, uh, you know, okay. it started off uh, innocently enough uh, in terms of uh, penny vandalism when I broke a window, and ultimately I was sent to youth authority for uh, assault with a deadly weapon and uh, battery. And uh, they gave me a couple years in youth. A couple years. Yeah. Battery. What was, I guess, now that you know you're going in for a serious crime at that point, yeah. something more serious than what you were... You I didn't know. think it was serious. Wow. Because you already started, it started, you already developed you as it, you grow. You were normal. Was just you were started getting in with, with these more mature, mature heads that were yeah. doing stuff even bigger than what you were doing before. Yes. What was that? What were you seeing? So this is what, like the... Now we're looking at what years? I was uh, 15 now. 15 or 16. It's like the 50s, the 60s? Uh, no, this was in the 70s. Okay. My bad. If I, my 70s? years are off. My bad. I'm totally <laughs> yeah, it's like 1920s. No, I'm kidding. No, no, no. Where's my cane? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, what's, what's gang culture, or not gang culture, that community culture looking like at that time then? Like, because obviously, you know, as things develop, you know, generations change. What was it looking like then? Was it violent, very violent? Because uh, there's people talk like it's, it's more violent now. Uh, How was I, it then? I don't know if it's more violent now. I think it's different now. I mean, everything. It's, mm -hmm. The evolution of society changes. So what we thought was violent then may not be violent now. And we look at society now and we say, oh, those damn kids, they have no sense of nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's what they were saying about us. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Those damn kids, they have no sense about nothing. And it's, it's, it's the telephone scenario. You know right. what I mean? It's just changed. Um People are predominantly the same. Uh, the environment changes, probably structurally and visually, but people pop, uh, most predominantly remain the same. Um, 
And I don't know if it's any more violent today than it was back then. I think now we have access to hear more of uh, incidents taking place throughout the entire world gotcha. as opposed to then you only heard about things taking place in your community. You know what I mean? You, never, you seldom heard even about the community next to you. But now you can literally get on the phone and you can hear about, you know, uh, Egypt. Egypt. You can hear about the Far East. You can hear about Russia. You can hear about China. You can hear about down south. And you can hear about 41st Street all the way down to 58th. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if it's, if it's more violent now than it was then. I just know now we're exposed. Uh, we're, we have, I, I'm not even going to say exposed. We just we have access to that information more readily today. Mm. I've never even thought about it in that way because, like you said, it's just if anything, it's newspapers that are coming through the doors where you hear this stuff. But now it's like there's recordings, and I've kind of experienced that where I've told someone like, "Yo, you see what happened on like on TikTok? You see what's happening over here in the city? Oh, bro, it's always been like that." But now, like you said, we're seeing it more often on yeah, these platforms. It's like, to. okay, yeah. I, like, I didn't know that. But now Social was, media allows you access to all that. Before, it was like you said, you had to read it in a local newspaper. Mm -hmm. yeah. News, I mean, people were billionaires because they ran newspapers. There's very few newspapers anymore. You know what right. I mean? Right. Instead, you could sit in your car and just read. And and look at a TikTok or look at a video that someone shot and posted. You know right. what I mean? So, I mean, that's that. I think, I think society is the same. I think we're just exposed to more of it now. That's interesting. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Um, that brings me to, to was YA what it was now, the, the arch typical gladiator school thing at that time, knowing that things weren't. I, I'm just yeah. picturing them very early stages of this stuff. Yeah, you know? youth authority <clears throat> was where you learned how to survive in prison. You know what I mean, the uh, junior prison. Even then, it was already cat categorized. Oh, yeah, as that? it's yeah, it's that's the purpose for youth authority. Uh, you were already, in fact, they had a thing in youth authority where if you messed up in youth authority, it could ship you straight to prison. And I saw many people go from youth authority straight out to prison. Mm. And when I went to prison, I later seen them in prison. Hey, how long? How, wow. how come it took you so long to get here? Oh, you know what I mean, man. that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, that's what it was. They used to have um, Repressa. Uh, and then they had Fretzy Nallis. Those, mm. were the, those were the two main uh, institutions. Then they built California Youth Authority, mm. in Chino, and all those other youth authorities. And they started to have classifications of youth authorities, you know? Okay, uh, we're gonna send him because he's one of the worst of the worst, that term that I learned about in prison, as opposed to, oh, we're gonna send him to the school of Ventura, we're gonna house him in a dorm, and he can go to school with girls mm. because, you know, he's just a robber or something like that, you know what I mean? That's the way it worked, huh? And that's the way it worked. Yeah. And that's the way the prison system works today. Mm. It's a level four, it's level threes and level stuff three, like that. Twos. Right. So, so even then, you hit YA, you hit this gladiator school, you know that it's it's like your prep work before prison. That still didn't fucking like deter you at that point? What was moms and pops saying? Like, what the fuck? Like, how does this keep going? What was the whole deal with that? I, it, moms and pops used to... My pop never... First of all, my pop never visited me in jail. I spent oh, really? all those years in jail. He would write me. Uh, he would send me money or packages. But he would never visit me. And he told me, he says, I can't visit you in there because it hurts me too much to see you in that wow. situation. My mom and my grandmother, on the other hand, you know, typical Mexican family, they were up there as often as they can, bringing me homemade food. And, mm. and But again, even in youth authority, it wasn't uh, something that was uh, foreign to me anymore. Because youth authority were the same guys I was with in juvenile home. Got you. And, we and, just moved yeah. from juvenile hall to youth authority. Hey, how you been? It's been a while since I've seen you. Yeah, they had me over at that other place. You know what I mean? Gotcha. And then it was wider. It was open more. Uh, you had a trade line and, and you had uh, apps, access to school and stuff like that. I remember going in there. Remember I told you my self-esteem had been negatively impacted. And all this started, I believe, because my inability to learn. 
when I got the youth authority, I had a fourth grade level of education. So even in that environment where very seldom people had a decent education, I was still at the bottom of the run. Gotcha. So no? the same way you felt in the public mm. system, you still felt in the YA system. Absolutely. And in, and they told me, says uh, you can't you can't be in school with everybody else. You know what I mean? You, you have to go to special classes. And, and when even I went in there, that's nuts. Because you would think all those dudes, they already done fucked up high school. They're probably F's, and 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 even then, mm -hmm. you're still categorized something underneath that. Yeah. Huh? Right. And so it was just it was a thing that was heaped onto my self esteem again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And of course, now I'm in an environment where I can even be more violent, you know. Uh, and but they sent me to a special class, and the person that was going to teach me was one of the people that lived in the in Norwalk, but in another area, and who we often fought against out on the streets. Mm. But uh, he asked me. He came up to me and he says, "Hey, you know, I could teach you if you want to learn." And I tell him, "Yeah, I want to learn." And he taught me how to do multiplications with my fingers. And that was the beginning of me being able to educate myself. It was him in that youth authority in a classroom where people could barely spell their names, where I started on, on the path of educating myself. Oh, shoot. I mean, and it was taught to me by somebody from a neighborhood on the streets that I had uh, continuous rivalry with and had i seen him on the streets or had he had seen me we probably both would have attempted to annihilate one of the other that's a very wild idea like you're really going into this room and this yeah. person's teaching you yeah. and not in a negative way in a positive way yeah that's but now you didn't realize that then or you're realizing that after i didn't realize it then okay. i accepted it okay okay I didn't realize it. I accepted it. And years later, I helped him when he pulled up to San Quentin. Gotcha. In a positive or negative way? Positive way. Oh, okay, cool. Because, you know, that, that, that's, <laughs> Cause like, you know yeah. helping. That's, the way, it, that's yeah. the way it was. I mean, like I told you, you start seeing these people throughout your lifetime. That tells you that your life is no different from their life. You know what I mean? Right. What is the common connection between all these people that I've literally lived with a lifetime while you guys were out here going to school and going to parties and, and, and messing with girls and all that stuff? These same guys were with me for decades as we grew up. Right. You know what I mean? And I, I've never been able to con connect and often thought about it, what was the connection between all of them and me? Because we lived the same life. Hey, what you up to? Same shit you're up to. That was the statement. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How you been? Same as you. It's kind of funny. Without even thinking about it, though. Yeah. It is funny when you say it. It's right. tragic when you think about it. No, Absolutely. yeah, it's like it's funny hearing it, but the real <clears throat> truth behind it, it's fucked up. Yeah. Definitely. It's fucked up. Mm -hmm. So... Now you, so you went into YA. Now, what was YA culture like the same as people would say now? Drugs coming through with these youth. Like, you know, because the reason why I ask, because I know Cap, Cap is, is it technically YA Cap? No. No, so Cap, YA is basically the individuals who are too rough for Cap. Okay. Whatever, gotcha. quote unquote, whatever. Uh -huh. They created this mini prison now. For the rough juveniles, They're really oh, not saying that gotcha. you know whatever it sucks. It's no a, one's rough. It's the just, sophistication right. of criminality is much more than those that are kept in juvenile facilities, yeah. uh, and or and or age. Gotcha. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. age is just a fact too, right? You don't even have to be turned up or whatever. You right. could just be phased out, age, and then you just end up in YA, which is the precursor to prison. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, and I asked because I don't know if I even said this before on the podcast. Uh, there was that time with with uh, working in the nonprofit uh, sector. I was going to these camps, to the camps, to enroll people for programs. And I remember the first individual, the first kid I took, I, I did an intake with. I asked him, like, you know, I assumed already he's gonna say no, but I still asked the question, like, do you participate in any drugs and stuff like that? Assuming he's already been in there a few months, a few months. He's like, yeah, I still do. I'm like, you still do, but you're incarcerated. I'm like, what? What, is, what do you mean? He's like, oh yeah, we still smoke weed out here. I'm like, how do you? And I legit asked him, how do you guys even do that? 
it was like, oh, we they're the fans. They're like over here. I'm like, yo, they're still doing this even yeah. locked up, like or ideally locked up. So I asked with the why, why is worse? Then the, would that be still be happening? Yeah, and 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 I, I I accept the fact that you asked those things, but the question is not that what you asked. Mm -hmm. It's asked today. I was literally on a uh, on a Zoom meeting the other day mm -hmm. where they were talking about sending in what they call credible messengers, meaning people from the streets or people that have been in the joints and stuff that have gotten out to the streets and have some kind of clout surrounding them where a, a young kid that is involved uh, in, this line, uh, in this path of existence that, and that's new to it could look at one of these people and say, wow, he's telling me not to do this. Okay, so... They're talking about these people on the Zoom. Oh, we're going to bring them into these county juvenile facilities. But they're talking about drugs. And they're saying these young kids are dying in these institutions from taking fentanyl. And we got to figure out how they're bringing it in. Uh, it's either going to be them or their parents or their guards or we need to get drug dogs in there. And, and you know, they're probably we should stop having their families bring in food and shit like that. That's bullshit. Mm. The question should be asked, how are we treating them for drug use? Not how do we stop them from getting drugs? If you treat them and convince them through drug oh, yeah. deviation and, and harm reduction, they no longer use drugs. You don't need no damn dog to sniff out whether they have drugs. The problem is the questions being asked, they don't lead to a solution to the problem. So don't ask, how do you get them? Ask them, how can I treat you? Ask yourself, how can I treat this young man so he don't want to smoke marijuana, so he don't want to take fentanyl pills, so he don't want to sling drugs on the yard? You know what I mean? That's the question to ask. Otherwise, you're going to continue to have the revolving door of civilization impact the communities that are growing up. That's wild. I've never even Dude, thought about yeah. it. <laughs> Fuck, Jack. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. I've never thought about it in that perspective, wow. like at all. Like at all. Like, like you never. And it's ironic because I'm over talking about listening to them, understanding them. But that's the first step, understanding them. Not any I've never, other I've never even to... thought. I've never had no, any thoughts on that. I haven't thought too deep on it. But mm -hmm. as you said it, at first I was like, "Where are you going with it?" But it, you brought it home. You know that that was insane. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought about it that way. You, the problem is already there. It's already an issue. Fix that issue, and then when they bring in the drugs, the individual's issues that you just fixed, he has no need for it anymore. Right. So eventually, that that spout is going to close, and that's the end of that. I, I never. Yeah, it's a good approach to it. You know. A very unique approach to it. And there's my senora. Uh, her name's Dolores Canales. She's the one that's been helping me understand all these things. Uh, and she's uh, aware. That we both have a background, her and I. You know what I mean? So we're able to look at these things and, and not necessarily demonize the acts. First of all, I don't care if somebody uses drugs. You want to use drug? Go ahead, use drugs. You know what I mean? Who am I to tell you not to use drugs? Hell, I used drugs for years. Mm -hmm. I loved using drugs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Until I realized they screwed my life up. Mm. And that's where you got to get the point to. You have to make people realize it'll have a negative impact on you. Your shoulder might hurt. Your knees might go out. Your back might start to hurt. You know what I mean? And it's because of the impact and the activity you performed years ago. The, pr the problem is, how do you make a young person understand that? How do, you, how do you instill in a young person whose mental capacity uh, for comprehension is still at a stage of a limited stage uh, that these things will impact them years down the line? And to make a choice now so as to live a better life later. That's when tough. they have no concept of later. It's tough. There is no later. You're living in the day. Right. Life is too long. You they know, have no you, concept yeah. of later. Damn. So that's the things you have to think about. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, 
so you're going through the Swai thing, and I and and that just so that way we can uh, kind of get the because you did eventually all this juvenile hall time, all this juvenile stuff led you to be incarcerated. So aside from having all these sentences, smaller sentences, you eventually did a forty year stretch. Yes. What was the lead up to that? Um, I was, yeah. What was the lead up to that? I was released uh, from the California Youth Authority after sixteen months, I think. They gave me a couple years, but because of good time, you get out in 16 mm -hmm. months. I got out in 16 months, and within 90 days, maybe 120 days, I picked up a murder. You know what I mean? Uh, what's that, fucking six months, five months, if that? Yeah, somewhere around four or five months I got out. <laughs> I, I picked up a murder. Because, you know, uh, I got out of YA, man, and my, my criminal oh, mentality you, you was peaked. Got you. You know what I mean? I, I was, I was yeah. in an institution where it was... You know, how do you become a better criminal? Mm. Okay? And of course, nobody in there knows how to become a cr better criminal because there's no such <laughs> thing as a better criminal. Mm -hmm. The concept is, oh, I could be a criminal. I can get away with all these crimes all my life and live a wonderful mm. life. Bullshit. I mean, you can't. There's no way of becoming a better criminal. Criminality lives, leads to one of two things, death or imprisonment, which leads to death. We're all going to die anyhow, but I mean, it depends where you want to die at. I right. guess that matters. I like that. You know hey, I mean? we're all going to die. Where do you want to die at? You know, <laughs> and but. so, but I got out of YA and, and I was out only, you know, a few months and, and uh, gang related stuff. You know? At that point, it was full blown gang related. Like there was actual hate towards another group and you no, guys were combative. No, it was, it was the gang mentality. Got you. Got you. Which yeah. is way different. It's it, a gang mentality. It's different. You know, like I said, uh, for me, it was a community. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a gang. Mm -hmm. But when somebody inflicts negativity on that community, you raise, uh, you raise up to that uh, confrontation. You know what I mean? And, and that's what I did. Somebody was saying somebody was an informant that grew up with mm -hmm. me. And you can't say that about my friend and not have consequences. That was the way I was thinking. I mean, that's the same thinking yeah. incarceration applies. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, so as a result of that, went over there and we killed him. You know I mean, and I got arrested and went to prison. They gave me 15 years to life on it. In the 70s, 15 years of life. What year was this? This 70? was in 1978. 1978. So 1978, how old were you? I just turned 18. Oh, my God. Damn. 1978, just turned 18, and they... they pick you up for a full-blown hot one. Yeah. Was what they call it. Within six months, I was in San Quentin. Okay, so the judicial system moved swiftly back then, huh? It moved quickly. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? No I speedy don't... trial. They're like, there ain't none of that. You're going straight I to was... the judge. and you get... Six months later, I, I was getting off the bus at San Quentin. And so this is a 70s. San Quentin is the arch-typical prison. That's what, when people think of prison, they think of San Quentin, right? The, the whole... A lure around it, the the movies, the Alcatraz, it was, it was everything part they of that. thought, everything you've ever heard about it, that's what it was. Mm. It was not the. In the mornings, one of the jobs of one of the guys in there, it, he's called the key man, and in the morning at five thirty, he walked in one of the five blocks. Each block had their own key man, and he walked by every door. And he unlocked it. Manually unlocked every Manually door. Unlocked and there's it. probably what, 50 fucking doors on each tier or something? No, or? There was 250 Jesus. doors on each side. <laughs> there's that 500 <laughs> individuals on, in one block. You know what I mean? Double cells made it a thousand people in that block. Would that be considered overcrowding in today's, uh, you know? Well, imagine, and I heard it in a movie somewhere. Uh, somebody had went to prison and they put him in a prison cell and they closed the door and they said, uh, tomorrow morning the doors unlock and prison begins. Mm. Because that's when prison begins. Mm. When the doors unlock. unlock. And you're sitting there, you know. By then, though, I was already, you know, I was full-blown. I'm, I'm going to be the best criminal there is and all that. And, you know, so mm -hmm. when the, and the guys go by and they just start on spiking the doors and everybody comes out those cells. And, and in those days... San Quentin and Folsom were the prisons. You know what mm. I mean? You heard about them all over the place. 
And the guards didn't run the prisons. Those people doing time in the prison ran the prison. Those doors open and you could walk anywhere in the prison. You can go anywhere, do anything, no way. anywhere you want. You know like, I mean? like the movies, like the old school movies, huh? Yeah, and the yeah. guards walked the gun rails, and if they didn't like what you were doing, they dropped down and popped. Mm. You know what I mean? But other than that, that's you lived and survived in an institution that had thousands of men mm. walking the yard. Damn. It was a it was an experience. 18 years old, I'm imagining an experience. Right. You get to one of like the the again, like the epitome of what prison is, you know, and you're like, but here's Holy the thing. Shit. My first day, when they finally let me first when I got there, I was young. So they told me, We're gonna lock you up, you're too young, you we can't put you out on this yard, you'll become a victim. Mm. So I'm go to hell. Put me on the yard. Well, you're a big, big dude. You well, probably I were had healthy. that mentality okay. already. You know what I mean? I was already eight. I'm not afraid of nothing. Of course, mm-hmm. I was scared mm-hmm. shitless. Yeah. You know what I mean? But there, you're no way you're going to see see mm-hmm. fear in yeah. me. You know what yeah. I mean? Unless you look into my eyes, and I'm not going to let you see the fear in my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> so when they let me out, the very first time they let me out, after keeping me locked up for a month to think about whether I wanted to get mm-hmm. let, let out of that cell, they let me out, and, and they took me down to the front door, and they told me, hold out your arms. And I held out my arms, and they put in my arms what they called a fish kit, two blankets, two sheets, two pillowcases, a pair of boxers, socks, T-shirts. And then they told me, move forward. I stepped forward, and they closed the door. And they said, the paper tells you where to go. And that was it. I was out on the main yard, and I started walking out there, and the yard was full of people. I mean, there was 1,000 people, 1,500 people out there if there was anybody. But as soon as I got in view, I heard someone call my nickname. Hey! Oh, oh, man, yeah. And I turned. Of course, I was glad someone recognized me, you know what I mean? And I turned, and I literally seen five or six people I had been in juvenile hall with, youth authority with, standing right there. Here, let me get those blankets. How you been, man? We heard you were coming up. That first day, they took me to a cell, got me drunk, sent me back out on the yard. And when the count time came around, count was thrown off because I was sitting out on the yard drunk with my fish kit. Oh, man. Yeah. What? That's the way prison was. Did you? What happened? Did you? I'm just curious. They just took you to your cell. Oh, that was it. It wasn't like, nah, you just fucked up. You're going, you, you could, somebody could, they, <laughs> right. you know, they categorize that like escape and all kinds of shit nowadays. You'll get extra charges. You'll yeah. fucking, your oh, life's shit. over basically. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was sitting out there drunk with my fish kit. They told me, get your ass over there where you're supposed to be. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. Just <laughs> got out. Just got out. <laughs> North block. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'm new. Like, Give me the paper. Okay. Okay. Go over there. That's where you belong. That's it. So when you say like you're able to walk around in San Quentin, like you have access to like these like library, like you libraries and stuff like that, or even like TVs, and you can have you have access to all that kind of stuff. Um, they had just started letting TVs in San Quentin. You can okay. actually have if you had somebody out on the streets purchase you a TV and send it into you, so you can mm. have it in your cell. Mm-hmm. But you can also, if you had money, go to the canteen and purchase a TV right out the canteen. Back then, they sold anything you want. They sold you shoes, shirts, wow. you know, any, whatever you wanted. Yeah. You could buy a sewing kit, scissors. You know what I mean? It, it, scissors. Yeah, you could buy anything from the canteen at that time. So that was. It's a different, different, yeah, different, and then they learned from that, and obviously it's evolved to the, what it that is part, now, which yeah. is more punitive. It's more, more punitive. you know, and now it's kind of shifting a little bit. They got more education and stuff in there. They're giving programs back. But um, you, your journey is a little different than most people because somewhere along your term, you end up being classified or whatever, whatever, whatever it takes to end up in a shoe, in a hole or something. Yeah. Or, well, tell us so, about that. Uh, the evolution of the prison is like society. It changes over time. Um, so when I got there to the prison system, it was wide open. But they started to realize that in order to control uh, the new laws that they had implemented, uh, the new laws that they had implemented would not allow them to control the prison system with the amount of people they anticipated bringing into it. You have to remember, they already know they're going to fill up the prisons. 
The problem is, how do they control the prisons once they fill them up? Well, for the time I was in there, and I was in there 40 years, um, when I went to the prison system, there were 12 prisons in California. When I came out of the prison, <clears throat> there were 37 prisons in California. Wow, that's big During that same period of time, they had only uh, built two uh, higher education facilities. Mm. So that's where construction was. And they ha if they built those prisons, then they had to you fill them. them. You know what I mean? And that's what they did. But the way they did it is, okay, let's break them into sections. So when they started building <clears throat> Tehachapi, uh, they made them separate yards. Everybody wasn't going to be in the same yard. Okay? And they made them blocked in so they could block in. They realized they still had access to each other. So they created Corcoran, where they made them smaller sections in bigger buildings. Mm -hmm. And they realized they couldn't control them still how they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So they started to develop Pelican Bay, where they made it isolated and everybody was in a single cell in a block that only held eight people and that they controlled. I mean, so you would see, I would see drawings of people that did where they had bars, somebody standing at the bars. And then I seen a drawing, it's the evolution. It's, and then the drawing next to it is a person standing at the bars, but his bars are not bars, they're perforated steel with little pellet holes that you could look out. And then, of course, the evolution goes one step, and it has a solid steel door with just a hole and an eyeball drawn in it. Damn. You know what I mean? Because no matter what you do, no matter how you think about it, extreme has to continue until it's just absolutely ridiculous. All right? And in, or in society says against the Constitution, violates constitutional rule. So it, if you steal a candy bar, the scenario I used, you're going to steal a car and you're going to rob. That's the evolution of that of form. System, yeah. But what is the evolution of control? Ooh. You make your ability, the, you limit the ability of those you wish to control more and more and more and more until they absolutely have to depend on you to even raise a fork to eat. You know what I mean? And even then they'll say, take the metal fork from them and give them a plastic one. You know what I mean? Damn. That's the evolution of confinement, and that's where it's at. It's starting to shift. About every, I, It used to be about every 12 years, the pendulum would shake. You know what I mean? And it would go up, swing them one way, and it would swing the other way, and reform would come in. But this particular time, it just it swang and stopped. You know what I mean? No one greased it, and it held up there for probably almost 50 years, but it became too expensive. Mm. You think that that's where the spotlight and all that came primarily? Absolutely. Yeah. It became too expensive. Federal judges stepped in and said, you got a, a correctional facility, facilities, all of the Department of Corrections, its population is only 132,000. You have 184,000 individuals in there. You're sleeping them in gyms, in triple beds. So what did they do? They went to other states, and they rented prisons out there, and they shipped people shipped from everybody. California prisons yeah. to other states and put them in there. And they said, no, we don't, Your Honor. We don't have uh, you know, 185,000 inmates. We only have 127. That's because the rest were in other states. Oh, shoot. Damn, yeah, that's wild. That so they're really transitioning yeah. people out like that. And, and I'm curious, though. I'm curious. Um, shit, how many years did you have in when you got slammed down? Oh. And did you know that you that was going to be it? No, no. No, you don't know that. I, uh, so um, it was 1980. Two. 1982 or 1983. Mm. So you had like three, four years on the main I had already had, yeah, probably about 
three or four years in the general prison population, mm -hmm. which was a blast. Uh, and which then probably I, is what led you to being you know, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, well, what led me to, I, I actually did not violate any rule to be placed in solitary confinement. Mm. I was in another prison. They had transferred me out of San Quentin. I was in Soledad. I was in Solano State Prison. I was uh, programming on a yard, and uh, an incident took place, and some people were assaulted with a knife. And I was locked up and put in the hole and shipped back to San Quentin. While in San Quentin, I was in the solitary confinement unit, which used to have small yards, and you can have 10, 15 people out on the yard together. Uh, we used to talk about exercise periods, rules to live by on that yard, because it was a small environment and you had a lot of people there. There were certain times to take showers. They didn't want people using the bathroom. Uh, number one was okay, stand up, but you don't come out there and start squatting down and using the bathroom mm -hmm. on the yard because it disrupts everything. You know what I mean, people are out there trying to get whatever little exercise they can get in. Mm -hmm. So to do that, we used to stop and we used to gather and we used to tell me, hey, we, we got to you know, clean up after ourselves, put the weights away. And, and it was in one of those meetings on the yard that uh, an administrator walked by. And I was talking about something. Uh, it might have been cleaning the yard or putting the weights, stacking the weights back up. And the administrator seen it. And they went in and they called me into classification and said that I was responsible for controlling the yard. And they classified me as a gang associate in control of the yard. And that was it. It was in 1987 mm. they did that. And from then they gave me an indeterminate security housing unit uh, status, meaning uh, I could only get out of the hole if I provided information to the guards or if I paroled uh, or if I died. That's where you got the term debrief, parole, or die years later when, the, when we started being active. Holy that's shit. That's a lot. And, and that's a lot. And you, that wasn't something you had pictured at that point. That wasn't, you mm. were, you were the, probably one of the first ones to experience a real indeterminate shoe. Yeah, it, it started, right? of course, the same people I knew were the same people that started getting mm. indeterminate shoes. After that, though, was, it was just, you know, and they had, uh, legislative meetings on this. And some of the senators and assembly people in California asked, well, what is required to be placed in the shoe indeterminately? And uh, I remember Holly Mitchell uh, asked the question, mm -hmm. and, and one of the, the CDC guards told her, well, if you have uh, uh, books or drawings, she says, what kind of books? Well, it depends what ethnic group you are. But if you're black and you have a book on Malcolm X or George Jackson, she said they, that could be a mark against you and we can keep you in the solitary confinement indeterminately. Mm. And I remember her saying it because it was advertised uh, on the television. She says, well, hell, I would have been placed in security housing unit indeterminately. I'm not a gang member. But that's it was innocuous information that resulted in uh, decades of confinement in solitary confinement. Dang, so that's you have a mix of everything that, like even the smallest stuff are, are, are being an, are becoming an issue. Yeah. The smallest stuff are becoming an issue. What was that experience like now that you're in confinement? You're in there, like, now how are you feeling mental uh, health-wise, I guess? I, well, first of all, when you're... The, the design of the institution was designed to deprive you deprive your sensory inputs, uh, visual and uh, auditory, uh, uh, physical, uh, all these things uh, were designed into the prison uh, in order to isolate you. Remember what I told you about isolating? Mm -hmm. The bars, then the door, right. and then the eye thing. Uh, and they found through military tactics that uh, you cannot control people unless you break people. Mm. So the institution was designed to break people mentally. And once you break mentally, then you become uh, uh, subservient to those that control you. Mm. And they can then tell you how to do, how to do, what to do, when to do, 
and why to do and why not to do. Because you're, you remember, you've already lost your mental faculties. That, and, and immediately when that happens, uh, even if you regain them, you feel a sense of um, inability to sustain your existence without the support of somebody that saved you from that moment uh, where you were experiencing extreme mental trauma, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've seen thousands of people break mentally. I've seen people, you could be talking to them and you, you just hear it, you say, oh, shit. You know? What, like, like they would start saying some wild stuff? Or? Oh, right. Wild and or... you know they or, lost or, it? Or? Yeah, they would start to be incoherent. You're, you're talking about somebody that is losing the ability to reason rationally. Mm. And that is, as a result, a direct result of being confined in an area where you're deprived of exercising your sensory capacities as a human being. And that's what happened. People would come out their cell, climb up with the bars, and just dive off the tier. You mean? Or you'd hear them go crazy and start cutting their wrists, or rubbing human feces all over themselves, you know? People, people that you knew, what? that you that you seen and you thought were gonna keep it together, and oh, you just yeah. like, what? Just absolutely. I've seen friends of mine just lose their mind. One day to the next. They're just crazy. Oh, shit. And you're sitting in that cell this entire time wondering when it's going to happen to you. To you. That's oh, scary. Oh, my God. You know I mean? Wondering when it's going to happen to you. And you're reading and you're writing and you're drawing and you're doing whatever you could do in order to retain your mental faculties. I, man, I taught myself yoga. I, I, you know, I did everything in that cell mm -hmm. for decades. Uh, but it's always on your mind. Do, do, thinking back on it, I don't know. Sometimes when I think back in my, like my time in prison or whatever, it's I always it's so fucking fuzzy because the reality is you're doing the same thing every day, just different conversations. So how fuzzy is it thinking back on 35 years in the shoe? Is it is it just like what can you think if you really think like you can't think day by day or year by year because it's all one constant motion picture of the same it is day right yeah. Uh, one of the first things I had to do when I was placed in the security housing unit uh, is you have to develop a routine. Mm -hmm. And that routine has to become so ingrained in your brain that when the lights go out, when, when the fuses blow and you lose all power and your TV's disappeared and your radio's off, you can fold your clothes and you can move around in your cell and know exactly where everything goes. Because you've done it a thousand mm. times. You know what I mean? That routine helps you when you start to think that you're losing uh, the capacity to reason. Uh, when things start to get fuzzy or when you have anxiety attacks in your cell and you can't breathe, but you can't escape your cell. Mm. And you can't tell nobody, hey, I'm panicking over here. You know what I mean? I can't breathe. I feel like I'm going to die. You got to sit there and suck it up because if you say that over the tear, you're vulnerable. Your inability to sustain your existence in that environment made you weak. Mm. You know? so and you that's have, frowned upon. That's frowned upon. Mm. How can you be trusted if the cell broke you? Mm. That That's uh, how, how uh, intense is that though that... That's considered, so, and again, I know the prison culture, right, whatever, but just thinking from a, just a humanistic perspective, like where you, you get to the lowest point where the damn cell is breaking you and that's considered a weakness when these four walls, you've been there 20, 30, 35 years, you would think if you bow out however way you need to bow out, it's like you did your fucking thing to save yourself, your sanity, your person, your... Well, you don't realize those things that... <clears throat> I thought I reached that point. Uh, for me, I made the decision uh, because they always told me, the guards always told me, we're going to break you. Mm. One of these days, we're going to break you. Yeah. And you're going to tell us everything you know, and you're going to do what we want you to do. And I said, all right. That gave me motivation. That gave you, you know motivation. What I mean? uh, but there was a point where after su uh, suffering anxiety attacks all the damn time, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, trying to... Re 
retain my sanity, trying to learn meditation and yoga in order to try to calm my inner being and all that. Uh, there, there finally came a point where I said, you know what, to hell with this. I'm going to go crazy. Because at least if I'm crazy, I won't know I'm in this environment. But I'm not walking out of here. You know what I mean? So I decided to go crazy. And when it came, when I had anxiety attacks or when I started to question my sanity, it wasn't fight against it because it's, it's a futile battle. You're fighting against yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's your inner, inner organs that are affecting you. How do you change your inner organs from uh, reacting naturally as a result of the release of adrenaline or endorphins or whatever kind of chemical that's being released in your brain in order to affect your body? And you're fighting against that. So I just said to hell with that, man. Just let me go crazy and then I won't even know any of this reality exists. What's going crazy? Look, look. What does that look like? like well, uh, for me, it was the loss of the ability to understand reality. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Crazy, I guess, for you know, can mean anything to anybody. But for me, that was it was. If I went crazy, then I wouldn't even understand this reality that is torturing me, that I'm suffering daily. So during this whole time, and as you're saying it, you 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 haven't mentioned. Um, the desire or the possibility or the you know just the thought of going home that wasn't i never i never believed i would ever go home i thought i was going to die mm. in that cell wow. the only question for me was was i going to die in that cell uh without giving information to the guards oh shit yeah or or was it going to be the loss of the ability to decipher and reality from you know mm -hmm. hallucination so i decided a hallucination i'll just die this way you know what i mean that's tough that's it's, tough. A, it's a battle you do battle. so people say how did you last that long you know how how did you spend 40 years in prison how did you spend all those decades in solitary confinement i don't know i did i don't know if i would have made it the next day they let me out this day. I don't know if I would have made it that Any day. More than that. You know what I mean? So when you say, and I reached that reality, I reached that conclusion, and I reached that understanding that how do I then <clears throat> um, belittle, uh, disregard, uh, or, or look down on somebody that has reached that point? And that can no longer take any more because they're just not humanly capable of doing it. And they said, please, remove me from solitary confinement. I can't, I can't do it no more. I used to think that was weak. Yeah, yeah. But who am I now, now that I'm wiser in that aspect, who am I to say that was weak? You know what I mean? And who is to say that the next day, I would not have been weak. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because we don't know our limits until our limit is reached. And once that limit is reached, then we know it. And by that time, uh, it's not a matter of changing. It's a matter of how it's going to unfold. Got you. So, so you did 35 years um, back there. And at a certain point, I know for sure. And we had a gentleman, Ernie, um, good interview. That's the one that I kind of sent you to look over. But um, he was part of the hunger strikes. Um, he didn't do as much time as that. But was the hunger strikes, the human rights folks shedding light on that situation? Was it the accumulation of all that that eventually allowed you to be released from solitary confinement? Yes, it was that that uh, allowed me eventually to be released from solitary confinement. It, it was what allowed me to get out the shoe. Um, but when you talk about human rights organizations, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's very important to understand that uh, the reason we got out of the shoe is because of three things that took place simultaneously. Um, first, those of us that had been in the shoe for decades, uh, 
realize that the battle we were fighting against each other because of where we were from or geographically located in California gotcha. or something like that uh, was a battle that uh, was not beneficial to anybody. And so what happened is there was a, a, a non-hostility pact developed against all those factions in prison. Blacks, whites, northern Mexicans, and southern Mexicans uh, decided we're not going to go out at each other no more. We're not going to fight each other mm. because the common enemy, enemy here is those that are confining us and subjecting us to torture. Okay. Real quick, and that's what it was categorized as inhumane. It was considered a form of to torture. Absolutely. That's what ended up happening with the federal courts. They deemed solitary confinement as a form of torture, and that's why they... Right? And that was through the Ashker uh, legal uh, proceedings. Was that one of the three things that you mentioned? That, this, okay. that Ashker was, uh, was litigating it with an individual named Danny Truxel. They had started litigating this civil rights action about uh, being confined in solitary confinement uh, for decades. And uh, Ashker uh, eventually became a class action suit that was picked up uh, by legal organizations uh, that represented a, the population mm -hmm. as a class. At the same time that was taking place, we had outside organizations taking place. That's how I uh, came to uh, know, met, uh, know my wife. That's Her right. and family members uh, mobilized communities throughout California to start protesting and marching and advocating for the closing down of solitary confinement and the release of those of us that had been in there for decades. The other aspect was we started to uh, work with the political arena. Uh, uh, senators, assembly persons, through the media, this type of media. Mm -hmm. And they started blasting out on the phones, uh, on the uh, radios, on TVs. They started having hearings. And, and uh, state representatives were saying, what do you mean people have been in solitary confinement for 30 and 40 years? Mm. The Department of Correction had a shroud of secrecy that was not being able to be uh, dispersed into the community. So many of the communities weren't aware of this, including the political uh, representatives of those communities. But when families got involved, they started contacting them and saying, hey, my family member has been in here for these many decades. He's going crazy as a result of the infliction of torture, psychological torture. Yeah. So there was an axis of three main prongs that took collective combination uh, to impact the system. And the biggest one was uh, those of us in prison uh, that initiated a hunger strike. I remember the first one, uh, there were 6,000 people that were involved. Mm -hmm. This was in 2011. Uh, and then the Department of Corrections said they were going to meet the demands of, of the hunger strike. But they didn't. Of course they didn't. Uh, so a second was initiated in 2012. And 12,000 people were involved in it. And, of course, they came back and said, well, so we're going to meet the... It, it doubled. doubled. said, we're going to meet the demands of the hunger strike. And I want you to know that none of the demands were, were outrageous. Mm -hmm. The demands were, stop punishing me if you do something wrong. Because if you did something wrong at that time, Damien and I would be punished as a result of your actions mm -hmm. because you're Mexican and you're from Southern California. So all Mexican Southern Californians would be subjected to punishment, deprivation of incentives. You know what yeah. I mean? So it was to eliminate that. Second, it was to eliminate uh, the confidential information uh, disclosure form format, wherein you could tell Damien, you know what? This guy right here is selling drugs. Damon can tell a guard, and I could be locked up indefinitely. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there was no way to question that because once the guard says, I was informed by a confidential informant that Morris is out on the yard selling drugs, 
that information is never questioned. It has no way of being uh, opposed. Like you won't go to trial or anything. For Nothing. You. Like it's like and the courts it. would not accept it. Mm -hmm. The court said, "Hey, this individual says that uh, the confidential inf informant says he told him, then that's the truth." Later on, through the Ashker case, they found out that that wasn't the case. That the guards were in fact uh, fabricating and drafting these documents and submitting them and indicating that the confidential informant told them, and thousands of people were locked up as a result of that. Uh, that particular atrocity. policy. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, but the Ash Group brought that to light. The hunger strikes brought unity within the populations. I was in a pod one time where they opened every door in there, and there was blacks, whites, northern, and southern Mexicans. We all stepped out of our cell. And we shook each other's hands, and we talked to each other. And the guard who was standing at the window with his rifle already pointing in there panicked. He didn't just watch. He pulled his gun back, grabbed the phone, and immediately reported that there was no violence when the doors were open. And that panicked the administration. If these guys ain't fighting against each other, they're going to fight against us. Then who are they going to be angry mm, against? Right. You know what I mean? So those things com combined. Family on the streets, the Ashker decision, the non-hostility pact, and the media, uh, the media distribution of information uh, that was taking uh, place uh, as a result of what was going in and out. And in fact, they tried to stop that. They started stopping our newspapers. They started stopping our letters. Interesting. You know what I mean? In order to curtail uh, what information was it's coming in and out. In. You know what I mean? But it changed. It, 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 it impacted. The last hunger strike, 30,000 people went on hunger That's strikes. I remember laying in bed, and a person that was in the lower tier yelled up to me and says, Hey, Jack, are you awake? It was probably about 5 in the morning. I said, No, I'm just kicking back right here. He says, Get up. Turn on your TV. Put it on channel seven, and I did. And on the bottom row, on the ticker, it said, 30,000 California prisoners on hunger strike." Oh man, made the made the made the news. You know what made I mean? the big leagues. I seen on a news clip in Israel, someone spray painted on a wall, "We support hunger strike at Pelican Bay." What? You know what I mean? It was it's fucking nuts. It was worldwide. We're talking 30,000 individuals hunger striking. The world know about it. You know what I mean? That means the administrators and our public representatives had to address it. And it resulted in all of us getting out the hole. Mm. Almost that, all of us. That was what, Ashker yeah. is still in the hole. They're still trying to break him. Even though he won the lawsuit, basically. Even though he won the lawsuit. That's crazy. And I'm sure that's a whole other thing. And I would love to figure out some detail. I haven't read about it. But I would love to do some research on that, figuring out why is that the case, you know? Well, uh, last two weeks ago, federal court issued an order uh, saying that the California Department of Corrections is retaliating against Ashker. Yeah, absolutely. That's and they granted Ashker's uh, petition. And, uh, but they said they are not going to release Ashker from solitary confinement until they appeal all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Which, which will can take, take years. forever. Oh, mm -hmm. man. That's a nice little fucking way to go about it to where you're still punishing him just by the default yeah. fucking process of the courts. Because the process of the courts. Yeah. Which the ultimate goal would be that he gets out. Like, ideally, he's supposed to. Or they yeah. may even still deny it then. Even then, they can do another motion, and then you're still sitting there because an appeal That's can take 10, days, 10 years, you know? But, of course, the most important thing about this whole topic is... Uh, how do you avoid having to even deal with any of that stuff? Important, yes. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. uh, how do you avoid having to uh, live in a cell where you have to fight insanity? How do you avoid uh, living in an environment where you have to worry about your safety? How do you avoid being tortured? Uh, I mean... Do you have an answer for that? I, I, have the, I, have, I got the answer. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it was so simple after decades of life. And I got the answer. And I know the secret now. And that is, don't break the law. 
It's that fucking simple. It's you know? that damn yeah. simple. Don't I don't break the law. I don't break the law no more. And I've been out on the streets almost six years. I won't even cross the street unless that little white man is in that green box. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I don't break the law no more. And I have been out and I have been prospering in this world. I got things now that they can't take from me. Mm. You know what I mean? They can't kick my door in. Well, they can, but <laughs> right. But yeah, but I've not right. violated any mm-hmm. law. There's nothing in my house that's illegal. I own everything that I've bought. You know what I mean? And I've bought it with clean money, and it can count for everything. Right. There's n- you pay the taxes. Secret, pay my taxes. I, you know all that. You have to decide where you want to die. We're all gonna die. That's the path. That, uh, when you ask somebody, well, what do you want in life? I don't know. Good. You don't need to know. I know what's going to happen at the end of your life. You're going to die. Same as me. All of us know what is the final destination of our journey. We're dead, all of us. Okay. What we have to live is the journey. And, and, and we got to stop trying to live somebody else's journey. You know what I mean? Pick your journey and live your journey. That is what is going to determine whether you're going to be able to walk to the top of a mountain, lay down in a field of wild tulips and die peacefully, or if you're going to sit in a cell struggling with insanity and die of anxiety and nobody else around you. Hmm. And I've known plenty of people that have died that lonely death, and none of them want to die in that cell alone. Just thinking about it, that's the first thing I thought when you said that was like how cold that must be. That was a worst nightmare for anyone, right? Always thinking of like, what if you're from fucking LA? What if you die all the way in Represa, California, where no one knows you from the real world? No one knows who you really are. No one, and that's it. End of story, and no one knows what the hell happened. And it's not even you know? that. It's nobody cares. Yeah, that right. Part. That's the hard part. You, you sit in that cell and you live a lifetime with loyalties to people that when you die, and I've said it a million times, and, and I'm speaking as an example. I've seen many of my, I've seen many people that I've known die, and I've brushed it off. Well, they're dead. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you can't stop there in that environment and contemplate the sorrows of loss. When you have to deal with the difficulties of survival. Definitely. That, that's the fucking reality, yeah. man. Um, you know, let, let's transition to the latter half of your, of your the, the end of your story, which I happen to know a little bit about because my brother, you know. So you, so you end up getting released from solitary confinement and you land in Ironwood. And that's kind of like the beginning of your, your, where you had the epiphany and you, you right the realization, should I say of you're coming home or there might be a slight possibility or something. No, I, I, I didn't believe, uh, I didn't believe I was going to be coming home. In fact, when they released me from solitary confinement and they sent me down to Ironwood state prison, uh, I was absolutely sure that I was going to last maybe a month to three mm-hmm. before they put me back in solitary confinement. Wow. After all, that is what my life had been. Mm-hmm. Correct. How am I going to expect anything else? They were going to say, this guy is doing something out on the yard, put him back in the hole. You know what I mean? Uh, I was fortunate that I met your brother. I was fortunate that I met the other people that mm-hmm. I met there at Ironwood State Prison who were doing programs in an institution that allowed you the opportunity to at least try to gain parole. I did not anticipate that when I got out there, but I had people come up to me on both sides of me and say, here, and hand me a handful of drugs. Here, all the heroin you want, this is yours. Make money or do it in your cell. And then the other one says, if you do anything on this yard, they'll know about it. I chose if they do if you do anything on this yard, no, they'll no know about it. it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I told them, thank you. I don't want it. You know what I mean? And then 
I started to live in there. I was limited in who I conversed with uh, over certain matters and over periods of time. But I never turned anybody away from talking to them. I never disregarded. I just, people started to recognize that I was not concerned with who was running the yard or who had this or who had that or what was going to be given to me. A friend of mine, uh, and he wasn't a friend at that time, he did it because he thought when I got on the yard, I deserved it because of what I had been through. And he put me in a cell by myself. And he told me, as long as you're on this yard, he says, you can have a single cell. I'll keep you single cell. And he did. Mm. For all the time I was on the yard, I had a single cell. You know, and and I didn't have to uh, live with somebody else mm -hmm. to experience, especially coming out of the hole after being in a cell by myself right. for decades. Then Johnny and them came to me. Well, it came, a guy came up to me named Scott Budnick, and he asked me, hey, can you help me out? I said, how? And he says, if I get you into the college, he says, can you teach the youngsters? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't teach them. They wanted me to sit in a class because... They knew that if I was in that class, nobody else is going to act up in that class. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, because it had the potential to affect, to affect my time. And no one was going to you know, negatively impact my existence right, in right. there. So he says, if you could just go into the class, we'll get you into college, and we'll give you a pay number, and just be in class. And I said, all right. Remember, I didn't think I was going to last out there, so definitely, I'll yeah. you know do this and get what I can while I can, and then I'll go back to the hole. But then the rest of the guys came, Johnny and Hugo and mm -hmm. and Kike and you know all these guys that were programming. And when I say programming, I mean involved in groups and right. involved in college and, mm -hmm. and trying to help youth and and trying to deter uh, negative activity. Uh, through communication, right. logic, mm -hmm. understanding. Instead of saying, don't do this, don't do that. They were saying, these are the consequences. You want to do it, go ahead. I'm just letting you know. Right? And, and I, I became a tutor and I began to learn and I, education became you know, more prevalent. And of course, I had been educating all myself in all those years in that cell. So I wasn't foreign to it no more. In fact, I thrived on it. You know yeah, what I mean? I loved man. it. And... Uh, and it helped me. Uh, and I started, and the, the young guys that believed coming into the prison system that they had to be as hard as nails, carry a knife, and put in work when it was time without question, started to realize they didn't have to. They look at me and they say, Jack doesn't do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why do we need to do that? Mm -hmm. And they would say, hey, you know, this and this and this. And I said, well, what do you want from me? He says, well, do I need to do that? Not if you don't want to do it. <laughs> Simple as that. Yes, man. But you don't, you don't know those things when you're entering into a system at, mm. when you're a young kid and all you know is the system of what right. you heard. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. Everything you've ever heard about prison, any story you've ever read, any note you ever heard, any legend you've ever experienced, all of it's true. All that stuff is true about prison. It's happened a thousand times. It just doesn't necessarily happen daily. Mm. And it just doesn't necessarily have to impact your existence. Mm. You know what I mean? But every story is true. And every person you've heard about, they've probably done that. But a lot of it becomes fabricated. You know what I mean? A lot of it just turns into legend. And you become a legend as opposed to a, an actuality. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I sent in those schools. And, and, mm. and, and the youngsters started to change their perspective. You know what I mean? Some of them. And I hope, and I went back. You went back? I went the... back into that same prison not too long ago, and I seen some of those faces mm. still. And I sat down oh, and right. I talked to them, and I talked to new faces. And I get letters all the time where I work from them saying, hey, you know, thank you for coming and talking to us, and, and you know, I need help. I'm going I'm to work on getting out, and when I get out, can you help me? And Absolutely, come and see me. That's that's what's fulfilling for me now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so take us to when the parole date came, where you're, because those are reoccurring, right? Then you get denied. I, I um, was, I went to the parole board 
a total of 12 times. Whoa, shit. Uh, I was denied. My last parole board hearing before I was released, I was denied 10 years. Uh, I went in front of them and they said, uh, have you debriefed? That means give them, provide information. I said, no. Okay, well, then you're still an active gang member. 10 years. Wow. You know what I mean? It's all right. To me, it wasn't nothing. It was already my 12th yeah. time I have been in front of them, and it's not like, oh, okay, well, you know, I've done something different this time. They're going to let me out of prison, and they're going to say, man, you, you've shown us that, you know, you can live in the free world. I didn't expect it, so I never showed it. Uh, but when they transferred me down to Ironwood, a guy that was there named Tavo, uh, he talked to me. He says, hey, they denied you 10 years at your last parole board here? And I said, yeah, seven years had passed since then. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, have you uh, petitioned for an advanced hearing? And I said, no, nah, what the hell for? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Why would I do that? It's, <laughs> I'll wait three more years. I'll go again. They'll deny me another right. 10, 15 years. Real you know quick, I mean? And how fucked up is it that your mindset was already set to the where the, your thought of even wanting to go home wasn't even a thing? It, you know what it's? It was tantamount to uh, training an elephant. Have you ever heard the stories yeah. of training an elephant? Yeah. You get a baby elephant, and you put this big, thick chain on their foot, and you nail a spike into the ground, and that baby elephant, who doesn't know any different, pulls on that chain daily. Boom, boom. Daily he pulls on that chain. Months, years he pulls on that chain. Until one day he doesn't pull on the chain no more. And you could take that chain off and tie him with a piece of thread. And when the big elephant pulls on that piece of thread, who he could snap in a second, he feels it and he stops. Because he's mentally trained now. That he's pulling on a futile uh, attempt to gain freedom. You know what I mean? And that's how uh, institutional life is. You know what I mean? You develop the ability to survive in an institution, and you develop the ability to forget what life is in the free mm. world because they conflict. Right. Your reality is not that. So yeah. how, how can you even begin to grasp it? Why if, even think yeah. about it? You know what I mean? So that's what it was. But Tavo talked to me, and he says, he, he told me, he says, let me write one up for you. I'll show you how to do the work. We'll put it together. Mm. To, together. I said, all right, let's do one. And he did a lot of work on it for me. And, and Kike did a lot of work on it for me. And I submitted it. And within three months, they got back at me and they said, uh, your petition is granted. We're going to bring you to the parole board. Oh, shit. Still no funny feelings inside? Right. Like, oh, I'm about well, to... I, of course, I was stunned. I was like, what? Oh, shit. You mean okay. I'm going to go to the pro board in three months? They say, yeah. So they take me. I go through the steps. I go and see a psych. The psych sees me. And for the first time, the psych gives me a low reading. Being I'm, good or bad? That's good. You okay. have high, moderate, and low. Mm -hmm. Most people never get out if they, ever, if they have a moderate or a high. Mm, gotcha. You have to have a low. And most people don't get lows very okay. often. And they gave me a low. And I said, what the hell? But the zinger came is when I went in front of the parole board, they asked me three questions about my gang association. They said, are you gang associated? And I said, no. Have you been involved in any gang activity? I said, no. They said, well, we don't see any uh, 1030 forms. I said, no. And I answered yes and no. I didn't give them nothing else because I didn't expect nothing, nothing no else. Nothing, no paragraph, right. nothing. No. I had a, a, a handkerchief on my hand and I said just like this. No, yeah, no. You know what I mean? What? And I knew. I knew from the moment I walked in their attitude that only I could screw it up. And I walked out and I walked back in about an hour later and they granted me parole. Off of three uh, no's though? <laughs> it was very really? It was it was nothing to it, man. Oh, Even man. the district attorney said, uh, well, I have to say something. That's the opening statement, well, I have to say something like, there's not really anything I could say, we should parole them. 
But it's, I have to say something. Well, you know, his crime was committed this, blah, blah. and they know if all they're waiting on is your crime, the parole board won't deny you parole. You know what I mean? Because you've already done the time for your crime. Oh, snap. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know what I mean? But that's what she said. She started out and said, well, I have to say something, and I'll talk about his crime. You know what I mean? And at that point, they granted me parole. The thing, the hard part now is coming, you have to wait. Uh, even though you granted parole, you have to wait for five months to see if the parole board is going to overturn their decision. And then you have to wait another month to see if the governor is going to overturn mm-hmm. your you, you know what's trippy? We've had maybe four or five lifer interviews. Everyone at that point of their story, they say the exact same thing in the exact same words. The yeah. hard part comes after they grant me the parole. And that's because uh, anything you do within that six-month period will affect mm. your ability right. to parole. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time. You get a 115 for having window shades in your cell. You're not oh, going home. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? We're talking continue your life sentence because you don't like the sun shining on you. Which what used to be your everyday thing. It used yeah. to be your everyday thing. You yeah, literally nope, have to nope. shift that. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah, and I and, and you they don't grant they don't oppose it. They just let the time run out. This okay. way none of them can say, well, no, I granted him parole. You know what I mean? They said, Well, we granted him parole, but it was reviewed and there was no review action taken. So the time elapsed. And automatically it kicks in. And then the governor says, I made no decision on it. it. The time elapsed and he just kicked in. And that's because years ago they had paroled this guy named Horton. A guy, I think his name was Willie Horton. And it ruined the caucus's uh, chances of becoming president. Because he did something wrong. He fucked he up again. What? Granted, and as the governor, he yeah. granted the parole. Oh, shit. And they put it on the governor. Like, and he Willie let that Horton guy out. got out and raped and killed somebody. Dang. And it costed him the presidency of the United States. I, I like that tactic. Just let the time ride out, ride, ride out and no one has their name on it. Nobody has, nobody has accountability mm-hmm. on it. And Damn, our governor is so, going to run for president. And yeah. Hey, so, so the time runs out. What the fuck happens? Did, do, do, did you know that that six-month period was coming out or did you get caught beforehand? No, did you, you give all your shit away? You count it. What do you mean? Who knows? You're counting. You're counting you said, those days. Now you're counting days. Oh, the now days you're now counting you're days. Jack. Before you're you now counting, counting days. You know? And every day there's less stuff in your cell because every day you're every giving day. your stuff away. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You're not going to take it home with you because that's just not what's done. You know what I mean? It was accumulated in prison. You leave it in prison. Yeah. And you give it away. And soon you're just laying on the bunk one morning and the door opens and they tell you they want you an R&R. And that's what happened with me. You know what I mean? Heart pounding. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I hadn't been out in the free world in 40 years. So I went to violent. prison when disco music was being played on the radio. And when I got out, kids were walking around with handheld computers. You know what I mean? That's, that's like really what it is, bro. We don't see wild. it that way. That's a... <laughs> We've seen that mm. develop. We've just seen it develop. But you're coming out to a world where it's completely yeah. different. And so, my only exposure <laughs> was a... Damn wow. CD player or whatever they're called. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, so you, you get, you're going out or you're getting out, you're going through the process. Who picks you up? My sister. Your sister picks you up. And, and, and it's amazing that sister's still around and thank God right. that, that after that much time. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of my family had already died. Um, and that's my a father sad died, all my that, aunts but... and uncles, they had all died. You know what I mean? Uh, but my mother was still alive. And that's... Yes. That was oh, the blessing. Man. You know what I mean? Mm. That was the blessing. And I went home and she had cooked uh, my favorite meal. Oh, I love that. And so I had uh, tacos urados right there sitting on the table ready to go. That's and right. I, I, yeah. you know, I ate my feel. <laughs> so you get picked up and you get picked up in a car you probably had no idea about. You're like, what the heck is this car? Butt ins and, and they, so when you got busted, there was those long classic cars from like Back to the Future. That's the way I see it. The, the, the old school classic. DeLoreans. No, I, I actually had, when I got busted, I actually had just purchased a 1965 a Super Sport uh, for $1,000. I don't even know what that is. Me either. It just sounds. It like sounds tight though. Super like sounds, sporty. You, you said know? sport. That's all I need <laughs> yeah. to know. It was nice. I wish I had mm-hmm. it now. It would have been worth way more than a thousand bucks. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn. So 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 your sister's there. They're waiting on you. Um, what about a? Uh, um, 
Your wife. You met her in prison. You said you... No. You, or, no. Or... I, I met her in prison. Okay, that's when you mentioned it. Uh, not physically. I should have clarified. Through the... Um, I figured maybe because she's an advocate. She's an advocate. No, so. she was an advocate, but I used to listen to her on the radio. Oh, you fell in love with her voice. Uh, no, I didn't even know who she was. Oh, wow. Okay. You know what I mean, I, I didn't. I, I, the first time I heard her, she was on the radio uh, talking about the hunger strikes, the activities the families were pu putting on, the strikes and all that stuff. And uh, I thought her name was Gloria uh, for some reason. And I wrote about her. I wrote a couple books, and I wrote about her in one of my books, sitting here listening to the radio, and I'm listening to Gloria talk about the hunger strikes mm -hmm. and, and the and the uh, the marching that they're doing, what are you, protesting, protesting that they're doing out on the streets. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I get out, um, I'm out. Maybe um, no, I'm getting transferred out of Pelican Bay. And they put me on a bus, and next. Sitting next to me is Dolores' son. What? That is serendipity. For I don't me, know this yet. You know what I mean? All I know is that it's uh, that's her son, and I wanted to tell him thank you. Tell your mom thank you uh, for the activities and and the support she's been giving us. Mm -hmm. And I did. I turned to him. I said, "Hey, is your mother?" Uh, I, by this time, I realized it was uh, Dolores. I said, "Is your mother Dolores?" And he says, yeah. I said, will you do me a favor? Please let her know that uh, I appreciate all the support that she's been giving us during this hunger mm -hmm. strike period uh, uh, over the radio and, and the families and all that. And he goes, okay, I'll let her know. You know what I mean? And then I went to Ironwood, and then the years passed, and I got out. And uh, 30 days out on the streets, a friend of mine named Danny Murillo calls me up, and he says, um, Project Rebound, or my yeah, group, right, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and he calls me up and he says they they're having this event at uh, uh, Chucos, okay. it's a Chucos Youth Center, Youth yeah. Center, right, and says uh, we'd like to know if you'd come down and talk to the family members uh, in order to um, give them some hope, alleviate a little bit of that, that their family members may have an mm -hmm. opportunity mm -hmm. to get out, especially since I was never expected to get out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I said, all right, I'll do that. And he and he says, I'm going to call Dolores, who's going over there and see if she could pick you up, because I'm in the halfway house. Holy shit. Really? Did you you end up going through that? I the stayed whole, in the, the halfway house? I stayed the in the halfway house a year. I wanted to. Really? Mm -hmm. Because it, it benefited yes. me. You know what I mean? I stayed in there a year. I stayed in there six months, and they said, you can extend it six months. And I said, extend it. I mean, I had a family and everywhere to go, but I was... Working, I was making money, and I didn't have to pay rent. That part. <laughs> and and yeah, you yeah. know what? Most importantly, the transition would have been that much harder at It home. would have been very difficult. Way di more difficult. And I used to walk down, because it was in Hollywood. It was at Hollywood Reentry. I used to yep, walk down yep. to Hollywood Boulevard and sit at the donut shop, drink chocolate milk, eat donuts, and watch the people on Hollywood Boulevard. Just to trip out was, on that, huh? I was a, yeah, I was, you know, I was new. It was, I never seen this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And here I was in Hollywood, man, you know. Looking at all kinds of ethnic groups and nationalities and hearing different languages. Anyways, so Danny real, calls something up. Something we take for granted, but that you know, part, you, yeah. Man. Danny called up Dolores and asked Dolores, hey, can you pick up Jack and, and take him to Chuco's? What? And she said, no, I'm not that. picking him up. And, she, and he says, why not? Because Danny used my nickname. Mm. And uh, there's another guy with my nickname. And the other guy is is very non friendly. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so she says, "No, I'm not. I heard about that guy, and I'm not." And then he said, "You mean you, Jack Morris is not friendly?" And she says, "Jack Morris." He says, "Yeah, my homeboy." And then she says, "Oh, I thought you were talking about the other guy." Yeah. And and I, the buzz out here was I had gotten out. The buzz inside was I had gotten out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because. Nobody inside ever expected me to get out. Yeah. And everybody on the outside was enthusiastic about me getting out because this gave them hope that their loved ones who were yeah. similar to me uh, then had the potential of getting out. You know, So she came and picked me up. And that's the first time we met. And we went to Chuco's. And then the, some of the families had heard I was going over there. So they went over there. 
And uh, they decided, hey, man, let's take this guy out. They took me out that night, took me out to dinner, and then they drove me down to Venice Beach, where I had never been before. You know what I mean? Wow. Saw the things that, you know, all the stuff out there. All the crazy wild stuff. Right. Yeah. right. And yeah. it was, you know, and I took off my shoes and walked out into the ocean. You know what I mean? I hadn't. Sand, huh? I hadn't put my foot in sand yeah. on in the ocean for 40 years. You know what I mean? And and that's my introduction back into the world. Back into the yeah. world. <laughs> and Dolores, we started dating. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we ended up getting married mm -hmm. last year. And, and, and it's, and it's, Pretty crazy because Dolores is an advocate, well respected, well known in the reentry space, right? So, and you happen to be one of the individuals that like reform. You're an example of all that, you, the solitary yeah. confinement stuff, and you just happen to meet. Like it's a crazy fairy tale story, you know? It was, yeah, it was extremely serendipitous. Yes, yes. Um, shit. So you've been out six years now. I've been out almost six years, yeah. And you've been grinding, and everything has been forward momentum. And right. and what do you got going on right now? So. What, what, I got out and I went to work uh, for about five months at uh, uh, Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Okay, at the front shout door. out ARC. Uh, right. Because of the help I gave him by going into the college and Scott sitting Lennick. in the colleges yeah, mm -hmm. with the kids, when I got out, he hired me at his front desk. Uh, and I didn't want a full-time job. I had just done 40 years in prison. Last thing I wanted to do was come on and get an eight-hour job, you know? Mm -hmm. So he hired me part-time, put some money in my pocket and allowed me to acclimate into the community. About five months in, they hired me at St. John's Community Health. A name change just took place. They call it St. John's Community Center now, or Community Health. Before it was St. John's Well Child and Family me. Center. Uh, and so I started there as a community health worker. My job was to assist those exiting incarceration and provide them the things that they needed in order to help try to not recidivize. Mm. Uh, they were looking for a job. They were looking for education. They were looking for medical, dental, vision, mental health. Yeah. Whatever it was that they were looking for, my job became to find it for them. You know what I mean? And, and, and who, what a better candidate than someone who, who went through it and who knows it. And In fact, they hired me for that reason. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't going to hire me because I couldn't prove that I had just done 40 years in prison because I had nothing to document that I was, in fact, even a citizen uh, oh, of the United shit. States. Yeah, I had yeah. no documents. You know what I mean? All I had was a, a damn prison ID. But then I, I was able to show them the papers that I had been in prison all this. So they hired me. And then... Uh, I, I even went through... A, I don't know if it was when I first, first got out. But I ended up going to, to Jack to get some help. My brother's like, go see Jack at St. John's. And I went over there, signed up. I was like, yeah, shit. Let's get something going. That's, yeah. That's nice. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So even to even see that you guys are still connected in the community yeah, that man. you guys have built. Mm -hmm. it's well, it like, goes deeper than that because it does. Um, St. John's was having trouble retaining a a director for the reentry program, and they were bringing people in with master's degrees. You know, what I'm and and since I had been become one of the senior uh, community health workers, they were asking my opinion. Hey, what about these people? And I told man. I don't care if they have a master's degree. They don't know nothing about the reentry departments. Get them out of here. And I called Damien's brother, Johnny. And I told Johnny, man, come on down here, man. Be the director of the reentry department. Mm. Be my boss, in, a, in essence. Because if he hired, he was going to be my boss. You know what I mean? Which I don't mind because Johnny is one of the most humble individuals you can ever be around. Uh, he don't... Uh, jump to conclusions. He re rational. He's rational and reasoning. You know. We need to meet him, man. There's so much Some talking people about might think him. He's an asshole, we need to which meet he him. is. But you know, it, <laughs> but yeah, he I, has the right heart. Yeah, he, that's he what supported he's me, and and whenever I speak of him, I, I speak of him highly because I have nothing else to say mm. but that. But he was telling me, you know, I, I want to go to school. I want to do this. I said, the only reason you want to go to school is so you could get a job where they're going to pay you good money. I said, come over here and they'll pay you that money. You know what I mean? I didn't know they were going to lowball him. Oh, you know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but they gave him the job. And, and, of course, he became my boss. And he, I mean, the whole team loved him. You know what I mean? He did a fantastic job. Uh, he literally uh, brought the program from the dead back up. But, you know, yeah. like all good things, a, a person that has that much knowledge and that much capability to literally do anything in life that they want, 
ain't going to stay there long. So we only had him a couple years and he went off. You know what I mean? And they hired two more directors after him Mm. with master's degrees. They fired them both. And then I finally told him, why hire me? He said, yeah, but you know, these guys have masters and bachelors. And I said, I don't have, I don't have none of those things behind my name. You know what I mean? But I know this program and I can run it. And they and they said, well, okay. And I said, wait, not okay. You can't do to me like you did Johnny. <laughs> You're gonna have to give me some more money. You know what I mean? So we negotiated. I got what I wanted, and they hired me. And I'm now the director of the reentry program at St. John's. Yeah, that is beautiful to hear, man. I love that. Oh, congratulations, man. Congratulations. Yeah, man, that is a fucking story. You know, not even people that that been out here their whole life not even i'm not even we had a little brief discussion where i want to be you know not saying that's where you want to be but that could be very well along that road you Mm -hmm. know and and there's people out here that live their whole lives and still haven't figured it out or are not anywhere comfortable yet so you know the fact that you're you're somewhere you're situated you're grinding you're helping out giving back to the same community you know that we heard it you know at one point in time you know that's it's paramount you know it's important it's fucking I think that's what should be on every, everyone's mission, especially coming out, doing time, having been reformed. Some people, I tell them, some people that go back and recidivate, right, they're just not ready, right? Everyone's time is different. Not everyone's going to get out. Me, I knew from day one, like I said, I put it as simple as liking girls. I like girls, so I knew I never wanted to go back for that simple reason. I, and I dumb it down. There's obviously more reasons, but I tell people... Whatever that is for you, you got to really fucking think about it to, you know, turn around and never look back. Never look back. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the things you have to do. I mean, you found something that uh, motivated you not to want to go back. And that's good enough. I mean, that's good enough. That's you know good saying? enough. Yeah. You know what I mean, nobody could tell you, oh, no, that's not good enough. You have to yeah. think of something better. Bullshit. Yeah. It's worked. Yeah, that's what, that's what I tell people. I'm like, it sounds, I, I put it in a very like fundamental version of, of what really is behind my, my motivation. But I'm like, so you can just understand. If it's something as that simple that you have to figure out. That's something as simple as that can keep yeah. you away from that place. You know? But those are the understandings that come with maturity. Correct. You know what I mean? Correct. Unfortunately, we have to help those that don't have those Absolutely. maturities. Yeah. You know what I mean? How do we do that? I mean, that's a major goal for the future. How do we help somebody... Uh, that we know is going to, you can look right into their damn eyes and know that, hey, man, this person is definitely looking to pick up a gun. You know what I mean? Where he thinks the, uh, the life of criminality is, is exciting. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that he could be, uh, you know, criminal number one and be recognized mm-hmm. and feared throughout the lands. But you know what? When you're locked in a windowless concrete box, living with only your shadow, and there's nobody to be afraid of you except yourself, then it's not all that popular. You know what I mean? Once you reach that pinnacle of height that you're striving to be and you realize, hey, you're enjoying that pinnacle of height, but you're enjoying it by yourself. Oh. Then it's not all that fantastic getting there. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Shit, well, I think that was, I mean, that's pretty much it. We, we, we you know, I think we got your, your everything you know, we could have gotten deeper some things, but I think this is just a good overview, good testimony of, of your journey, you know? Um, shit, anything you would want to tell people sometime, and yeah, just maybe scoot in a little bit, that way the... Um, yeah, yeah, no, you're all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, anything that you want to maybe get out there as a last message, these podcasts tend to do a little well, you know what I'm saying? So if there's anybody that you want to touch, feel free. And there's know? that camera right there. That's that's, that's you straight. right there. Yeah, you know? yeah no, yeah. I, I mean... No, there's not. I, I don't do that no more. I, I just mm-hmm. I just live life. You know what I mean? Uh, and when it happens, I enjoy it. Uh, the goods and the bads, you got to take pleasure in them both. Absolutely. Uh, there's things out here now that I uh, confront that I wish I wouldn't have to, but when I was in there, I used to sit back and think about, man, I wish I could pay taxes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or I wish I, I had to take out the trash. Or I wish uh, that I can hold my mom. Something like that. You know, so mm-hmm. simple. When you're deprived of everything you have and you're given an opportunity to experience it once again, you take absolute pleasure in enjoying every aspect of it. So telling anybody indiv- individually that I want to say hi, no. 
I want to say hi to everybody. Those well, that I know even, and those that I don't hi, know. Just like a, a message, you know, like, mm-hmm. hey, stay the fuck out of prison. It's not, yeah. Obviously not, you know, but. No, I, I, I understand. Enjoy mm-hmm. life. There you be go. happy, man. You know what I mean? Uh, there's plenty of reasons not to be happy. Uh, mm. and, and don't dwell on those. Mm. Pass them up, man. Because when it's all said and done, try to think back. If you try to think back uh, to the times you weren't happy and you try to think back to the times you were, the ones you, when you were, they're more readily available to bring a smile to your face. You know what I mean? So chalk up the happy ones. Yeah, take them in. Take them in. Shit, I love it. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate you for shooting through. You know, I think this was one of the best podcasts that we had. I say that about all of them, but I really mean it on this one. (laughs) With that being said, Reentry Network Podcast, let's get it, baby. Bro.